Well, it's good to be back tonight. I hope you feel the same. Amen. And it's good always to be in the house of the Lord, is it not? I want you to understand, boy, I, I was excited to see those young people up here. And I got to sitting there thinking, that's the future. That's where our missionaries are going to come from. That's where our new preachers and staff members and teachers and boy, do we need to pray for those young people today. And uh, we're so thankful for this church and for the emphasis that it places on raising up and training and teaching and just being what it ought to be. It has been a pleasure. I want to thank Pastor Sullivan, Miss Brenda, for certainly my taking care of us. I, 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 I can't believe we were, every time we've been here, but this time especially, uh, the, we had a fruit basket that ate Manitoba. And I tried to eat it. I'll tell you, it was just chock full. The refrigerator chock full. The wonderful uh, uh, motel room for us to stay in. And for all of the meals. And especially, I think above all, for the fellowship. I've just enjoyed spending some time with your preacher. And getting to know him a little bit better. And some of you as well. It's good to have uh, rekindled some friendship. And some new ones along the way. And so, we're just glad to be here. We've been blessed and I'll tell you, if we left right now, our hearts are full, and uh, we leave here with a, a real renewed joy in just serving the Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, tonight, I'm struggled with the message this afternoon. I actually had two to preach, and I couldn't decide which one, so I'm going to preach both. And uh, we'll be out about midnight, I think. But anyway, no, I'm only kidding. Uh, but I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. What I'm preaching on tonight, I really don't believe, and I, of course I don't know, I can't see, all I can see is the outward. But if I've ever been in a church that had a greater spirit, I can't, I can't remember it. I believe the spirit of this church is one of the greatest. I call this the miracle church. I believe it with all my heart. Up here in this cold, frozen land. And it's not so bad this time. Like I said, it's warmed up. When I'm here in February, it was 30 some degrees below or whatever it was, 30, however you people call it. And uh, the, it's the frozen chosen up here. But uh, I'm going to tell you, I just enjoy uh, the spirit always as we've been here. And this, is, I think it's our fourth time, my fourth time. I think my wife's been here a hundred and some. <laughs> if you found your place in uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, if you can, if you're able to do so, would you join me in standing in honor of the Word of God as I read? I'm only going to read about seven verses and then have prayer, then you may be seated. Notice in verse number 1 of chapter 6, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too small or too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take the, thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. And he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Let's pray, shall we? Once again, Father, we're so thankful. Well, our hearts have been stirred already tonight through the singing, through the fellowship, through the choir special, through the special just before the message for the offertory. Lord, we could say amen, go home, and still be blessed above and beyond. But Lord, you now has come to the time when we've opened your blessed book. And oh, Holy Spirit, how we need your power and direction now in the next few moments. I pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight. Help me to relate that, which you've laid on my heart, in the way that would be simple and understandable. And then, Lord, I pray that everyone with an open ear and an open heart would receive it. That, Lord, tonight, once again, as we would leave this blessed building, that we would leave better than what we came in. 
willing to serve you. Now, Lord, bless the rest of the service. Thank you for all that you are. In Jesus' name we do ask it. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I'm moving a little bit slower tonight. Uh, your pastor uh, tortured me this week. He took me bowling. And uh, I'm finding those muscles that I haven't. I mean, I'm 74 years old. Let's get it right. Yeah. It's good for me to be able to pick up the bowling ball, let alone throw it. Amen. And I kind of felt like twinkle toes out there with the, you know, you got to get the right step in, you know, to, to get it. And uh, well, that's something else. But anyway. In our passage here, we find that uh, the school of the prophets, of course, had grown uh, so large to the point that they had outgrown their facilities and there was no room, again, for those servants. And as they were in the process of uh, building and constructing, uh, cutting down the wood to do that, uh, one of the young men lost the axe head. Well, it's a very familiar story. We know that. It fell in the Jordan River. And instantaneously he was overcome with grief because he had borrowed that axe head. In desperation, with nothing else he could do, he calls for Elisha. Uh, the great prophet, and that great prophet performs a miracle, and that axe head floats once again to the surface, and that man puts out his hand and receives it. You know, far too often, I think, we are uh, too quick to condemn uh, the young man for his careless act of maybe not paying attention uh, as he was cutting. But I do want you to remember this. He was doing a good work. He was still involved in doing something, but he had lost what was needed to accomplish the job. You know, so many times I think, and I don't think this church is that way, but I'm preaching a, a preventative message tonight. When sometimes when we get so blessed by God and we have such a wonderful ministry that a lot of times if we're not careful, we can let go of the thing or lose the power lose the direction, lose the burden, and uh, let it slip from us without even realizing it. And we need to be on guard. Listen, you are a blessed church. I told your pastor if I could get away with it, I'd join your church. I wouldn't be here, but I would join it. I don't know where my tithe would go, but uh, no. <laughs> because this is a church that we love, my wife and I. But the fact is, is it is a miracle church. I mean, the programs you have, the college, the young people, the excitement, the thrill, the, the numbers that you have, uh, learned, the Lord has blessed you with to come together, uh, that's wonderful. But don't ever lose the, what it took to get here. And sometimes when we get so involved in, and we get so blessed, if we're not careful, we can tend to sit back and we can become slowly, as the devil would do it, apathetic and uncaring. And this man was doing a good word, but the problem was he lost his cutting edge. The ax head that he lost represents, of course, the power that was required to do the job, to get that job done. And uh, certainly uh, no man can go out and with a stick and beat against a tree and hopefully to, to cause that tree to fall. He's got to have that ax head sharp that will be that biting tool to cut into the wood and to allow it to accomplish the task. And we need to be very careful that we don't lose our cutting edge the Holy Spirit. That head represents the Holy Spirit of God. And tonight, I want to just give you some things to think about, give you some things to be mindful of so that you don't lose that cutting edge, that you stay faithful, you stay on fire, you stay spiritual and empowered. It's not us, it's God through us in the person of the Holy Spirit to accomplish anything, amen? And if we lose that spirit, we're nothing but beating against that tree with a dead stick. We've got to have the cutting edge. So what does it require? What did it require for this young man to recover his cutting edge? Well, first of all, it required a concern. Look at verse number five. 
It said, but as one was felling a beam, the ax head fell into the water. Now notice this. And he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. It was a concern. He realized that right now everything was gone that he needed to have to accomplish the task. And he was concerned that he would not be able to do what was needed. He knew, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that he needed to have that ax head. And it got that. the first step, <clears throat> pardon me just a moment. You know, as you get older, your voice isn't as strong as it used to be. Of course, I'm not as strong as I used to be. My wife still calls me her hero. Of course, it's kind of like this now. All right. <clears throat> the first step in recovering that power of the Holy Spirit is coming to the place where we know that we do not have it. I wonder how many times uh, we serve God but we serve God in our strength, our power. We teach in our power. We preach in our power. We drive a bus or work a bus route in our power. We work in the uh, children's ministry in our power. We need to recognize when I do not have the power of God because it is the power of God that is required to accomplish what needs to be done. That was the condition of the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. They had lost the power of God. I believe that uh, too many have become content uh, to just to know that uh, they are serving God. They're going through the motions. But folks, listen, don't ever get to the place. Don't ever get to the place where you're just happy in church. Just here. Be powerful. This church needs power constantly. Then notice, secondly, not only a concern, but it involves a confession. Look at verse number five again. It says, uh, uh, the ax head fell into the water and he cried and said, alas, master, for it was borrowed. When this man saw the ax head fly off of his uh, uh, handle, it immediately he told Elisha what had happened. He confessed that he lost the cutting edge. By doing so, he admitted that it had become loose and that he had not taken time to do what was required to tighten it, to secure it, to keep it there. One of the hardest things for modern and prideful man, I think, to do is to come to the place where we know that we are lacking something and especially the Holy Spirit's power. I want to be a humble person. I'm not always humble. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, I, I have a pride just like everyone else does. But I want to get to the place where my humble spirit recognizes when I need more of God in my life. I want to keep myself humble. It is hard for us as prideful people today. And I'll tell you the truth. North Americans are prideful. And I'm talking about the United States as well as Canada. We have become a prideful people. And we need to be careful that we don't allow that to creep into the church house as well. He knew that what he was doing and where he was doing it and where he had lost his cutting edge. So also by confessing that he had lost it, as soon as it was gone, he knew where he had lost it. It was right there. He was mindful of that place. And we must remember the place where we lost that power of God, what has taken place in our life, maybe what distracted us, what caused us to get off track, that we lost that power of God in our life. When I got saved, I got the, I, I got, isn't that a good word? That's good English. My wife cringes when I preach. We have an English teacher in our church, and every time I preach, I watch her. And when she goes, well, I have to change that sentence. I received the Holy Spirit when I got saved. He doesn't leave me. He's permanently there. But he is that meek and quiet spirit. And what I have to do is constantly humble myself to him and yield to him for him to take charge. The more I give to him, the more he'll take of me. And I need to do that on a daily basis. And when I get to the place where I have lost that power of God, then I want to know and mark that place 
so that I can go back there and also return to that place in order to receive it. Notice it was involves a confession. Sometimes it's hard for us to confess that we're just not full of the Holy Spirit. We're prideful. We want to think we are. We want to act like we are. We pick up that songbook and boy, we'll sing and we'll have a smile on our face. We can wear a suit to church. We can look Good, we can talk good. But somewhere in our heart, we know that it's emotions, it's not power. We want the power of God, the person of the Holy Spirit. It involves a confession. Then it involves also a comprehension. Look at verse number five. But as one was felling a bean, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. The reason that this man was so upset was not only that he could not continue doing the job that was required, but that it, the axe head or the axe had been borrowed. He had borrowed it to help in the building process. In biblical do, uh, days, tools of iron were very rare and very costly. It was something for someone, wherever he borrowed it, that person that lent it to him had confidence in his uh, talent, his ability, and his uh, trustworthiness to ensure that he would return it in good condition. And now he was responsible. He would be responsible for replacing that lost axe head. The fact uh, that uh, he had lost it uh, was a, a, a major issue in his life. I want you to understand, when Jesus ascended, He left the Holy Spirit. He gave us. He sent the Holy Spirit to us. We have him. He's been implanted into our lives the moment we were saved. How am I treating that wonderful gift? How am I relating to that wonderful gift? Have I understood that it was given and I ought to be trustworthy? I ought to be faithful enough to deal with that entrustment in the right way. He was entrusted, uh, the Lord himself has entrusted us with the Holy Spirit and allowed us to borrow from him what is needed to achieve spiritual victories in our lives. We ought never take that for granted. We ought never treat that lightly. God has blessed us with the wonderful power of God. Listen, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That is the promise of God. It's not Jim Moore that can do it. It's not Pastor Sullivan that can do it. It is the Holy Spirit through us, using us, that will empower us to do it. In teaching a Sunday school class, working with a choir, singing, whatever it is, it is not us, it is the Holy Spirit through us that empowers us and and helps us. We need to have that. The comprehension that we can do nothing without him. We must understand that what we need to accomplish anything for God requires us to do so from, with the borrowed power of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1 verse number 8. Ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. You know why we're not winning people today? It's not that we're not going out. It's not that we don't have the ability and the uh, privilege of, uh, oh, we have everything. We have printed page. We have uh, television. We've got uh, magazines and paper and radio and all the rest. You know why we're losing the battle? Is because we're doing it without the Holy Spirit's power. We receive power. It's not me that wins somebody. I'm just the tool. I'm just the instrument that can carry the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit that reaches into that heart and begins to bring conviction and draws them woos them, loves them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have the power of God, the comprehension of what we need. And then I think it uh, involves a coming back. Look at verse number six. And the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither and the iron did swim. As soon as Elisha heard about the problem, He called the young man back to the place where the axe head was lost. Before it could be recovered, they had to go to the place where it was lost. I remember years ago, 
I was a youth pastor in southern Florida, and I had a good group of teenagers, and, and uh, my parents used to come down every winter from Michigan and spend about two or three months with us and, and stay with us, and that was always a joy. I loved my dad, and, and my dad had, a, he liked metal detecting. I don't know if you've ever done anything like that up here. He had a metal detector, and he'd go out, we'd go out to some uh, Boy Scout ranch or camp or something, and, and we'd find pennies, you know. Wow, he thought that was fun. But anyway, one day, uh, one of my teenagers called me up and said, uh, Preacher, we were down fishing uh, down by uh, this park on the water, and, and I'd lost my class ring. And I know that your dad's there, and you have metal detectors. Do you think you could go and at least look for it? And so we, I, I asked him, I said, now, George, where exactly did you lose the ring? Tell us the area you were in. And so he told us exactly where he was. And so we went, my dad and I, and we both had metal detectors, and we started walking the beach and around by the, the shoreline, and, and uh, sure enough, it wasn't long, and that thing began to beep. And we dug down a little bit from the tide coming in, and there was that class ring. What a joy it was to give it back to that young man and charge him 50 bucks. No, I didn't, but, <laughs> uh, but I thought to myself, we had to go to the place. We had to know where it was. If he would have said, well, it's somewhere along this long, we probably couldn't have found it. We have to know what the circumstances were surrounding when we lost the power of God in our life. And I need to go back to that place. Maybe it was a distraction. Maybe it was a, a misplaced priority. Maybe it was relying on our abilities instead of the abilities of God and through the Holy Spirit. But whatever it is, I have to go back to that place and I have to realize that was the cause. That's where I've lost it. And now I need to get it back in my life so that I can serve God and have it be successful for him. We need to come back. Then it involves a confrontation. Look at verse number six again. And the man of God said, where fell it? Where fell it? And he showed him the place. Elisha's response to the situation in that case is that he cut down that little twig, that stick, and cast it into the, the uh, river, and that ax head popped. You know, there's a lot of areas in the Word of God I'd like to be been there when it happened. Wouldn't you have loved to have stood uh, on the shore that day when Moses had the, the sea part and they crossed on dry ground? Wouldn't that have been exciting? I'd like to see the manna fall from heaven. I would love to see Jericho's walls falling down. There's so many things, and I can't wait to get to heaven and sit down with these men and just get their personal experience of it. But I'll tell you, this would be exciting, wouldn't it? To know that the ax head was gone, it's under the water, can't see it deep. And here he takes, now you would think he might call on God. God, I need you to raise it up and bring it down. Oh, what? He gets a stick. I don't know what the stick did, but the stick he threw, and when he did, boop. Now think, not only did it float, iron, but then it swam. Now I don't know how that happened. I mean, I've, I've seen two, two bladed axes, and I don't know if it went... I, I, I don't know. I believe it because it said. But it came back. It was there. A confrontation was needed. The miracle occurs when human means are abandoned and di divine help is sought. And that's what we need to do. Trusting a stick to make an axe head float seems to us crazy impossible, and yet in God's way, it worked. You know, it's always amazing how God's ways are always the best ways. Don't always understand how it works, but always understand that it's his way, and he just wants to prove himself real. For us to stop trying to do the work of the Lord by our means and our abilities, and just to step back and to place it in his hand is difficult for us. We want to think we're something special. You know, really, we're nothing. You know, God could use this pulpit to preach if he wanted to.
but I'm so thankful he used us. But I don't want to just preach. I want to have the power of God in the preaching. I want it to do something in the hearts of others. In John chapter 15, verse number 5, Jesus said, Without me, ye can do nothing. Boy, if we'd be reminded of that every day. Without you, Lord, I can't do anything. Without you, I need everything. And lastly, this, this evening, it involves a commitment. Look at verse number seven. Therefore, he said, take it up to thee and put out, uh, and he put out his hand and he took it. The last thing the young prophet did was to reach down and take the ax head into his hands. I, command, I imagine that after he did this, he went back to cutting the trees and building, but I believe before he did, he secured that axe head onto the axe handle. He made sure it wasn't going to slip again. He made sure that he was aware that he needed to have that cutting edge in order to accomplish the work, and he was not going to let it ever slip. You know, we have to be aware. We have to be understanding. Do I have the power of God? Am I living my Christian life not just by action? Not just saying, well, I went to church three times today. I'm okay. Or I've read my Bible today. Or I prayed today. Those are wonderful things, and we do not want to let them slip. But in order to successfully live the Christian life, I need the Holy Spirit of God. Do I have that tonight? Have I yielded, trusted to Him? God has all the power required to accomplish whatever he designed for your life and the life of this church. And all we have to do is reach out, take it, trust him by faith. Isn't that an exciting thing? You know, I believe, I love to come here. I love to see the faces. I love to see the people. I love to see this place filled. But I'm, I'm looking for the day and if I ever get a chance to come back again, I want to see that maybe that balcony extended vast, tear out the prayer rooms and put in more chairs because you got to have more people. Listen, that's not going to happen just by being here. It's going to happen when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of us and we go out and do what God wants us to do. How committed are you tonight to have God's power in your life? Do you know right now, right now, that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that you've yielded to Him, that you've allowed Him today, as you should, to fill you with His power, with His direction, with His guidance? Do you know that for sure? If not, where did you leave it? Would you go back and get it? Every one of us, every one of you, I'm not up here, but every one of you, has the right and the responsibility to help this church accomplish what God wants it to accomplish in this time. And to do that, each and every one of us, each and every one of you, need to have the Holy Spirit power and guidance in your life. Do you have that? I remember when I, God began to work in our heart about getting out of the Navy and that was a hard decision for us. I had 15 years. I only had five more to go. and I could have retired and had some money. In fact, I uh, had missionary come in, stay with us in the home one night. And I asked his opinion of it. And he said, if I were you, I'd stay in for the next five years. That way you'd have a retainer check, a, a retirement check. If the Lord called you to missions or to a little church, you'd have money coming in every month and, and uh, insurance and things. And Boy, that sounded real good. But I couldn't get away from the call of God in my life. God said, no, I, I think you need to get out now. This is what I want for your life. And I had to pray every day. My wife and I used to walk around our little subdivision. And we'd pray together and talk together about what we should do. And the day that I finally, I went to church. I used to work night check at the base. I was in charge of a, a shop. And uh, I, we had a revival. And I used to take my lunch hour when the re preaching would, just before the preaching would start. It was about a, oh, a five-mile drive. And so I'd drive quickly to the church, sit in the preaching, get back in the car, and go back and finish my, my night shift. One, that night, 
as we had been praying for weeks. I got into the car and started back to the base. And I said, Lord, if you want me to get out of the Navy and to be a preacher and go into the ministry, I'm going to do it. Holy Spirit, you help me. And boy, I'll tell you, that night, for the first time in a long time, that instant time, a peace came over me that said, that's exactly what I want you to do. We've never regretted it. God has taken care of us every bit, all the way through. We put two children through school, Christian school. We've done all that, and God has blessed us. Listen, it's all doing what God wants, but in order to do what God wants, you need the direction of the Holy Spirit. So it's important that you have it. Do you know for sure, right now, tonight, you have the fullness, not just the presence, but the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Father, I thank you tonight. Lord, I know the message was a little different. I know this church is a great church. I know that these people are, love you and they care for you. And yet, Lord, if we're not careful, we can allow things to slip, kind of take a second seat. And yet, Lord, this is so important that we keep the Holy Spirit in our lives if we're going to live successfully the Christian life and accomplish what you want. And Lord, I don't know the hearts of these good folks, but you do. And so Holy Spirit, I'm asking you right now to just speak to them. Help them to look at their life individually and to see do they have the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God in their life. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder how many of us tonight would humble ourselves and be honest maybe and say, you know, preacher, I know I'm saved. I know that heaven's my home. There's been a time in my life when I've trusted him and I know that I can't lose my salvation. But as I look at my life right now, I'm not sure that I have yielded myself and allowed the Holy Spirit to take charge. I'm not sure that I possess the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I wonder, preacher, would you just pray with me, pray for me, that I would constantly be mindful of the need of having that powerful person of the Holy Spirit. Here's my hand. Anyone like that tonight? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Several hands. God bless you. Listen, tonight, this is the time. This is the opportunity to say, Lord, help me. I'm going to yield to you. I want you to fill me, Holy Spirit, and help me to be a powerful, living Christian. Father, we thank you tonight. We ask your blessing now in the next few moments as we uh, give the invitation. Help, uh, Lord, if they need to, to respond in one way or the other, either at their seat or here at the altar, that, Lord, tonight we would leave here knowing that we have the fullness, the power, the direction, the infilling always of the Holy Spirit in our lives. With heads bowed, eyes closed, let's stand to our feet.